Okay, so here we go. Um, YouTube is 10. YouTube turned 10 this year. Uh, it's amazing to think uh, that YouTube's only 10 years old. There are. It's amazing because some people said when we started that we would never last more than 10 months. And actually, if you're my, if you're like my son who is 10, it's amazing to think that there was a time before. Uh, YouTube and online video existed. So when YouTube was created, it was created with one thing in mind, which is to make it possible to share video online. A decade ago, there was no easy way to share a video with anybody. Now it's something that we all do all of the time. So the usage of digital video is exploding. Uh, we're on track for something like 90% of the internet's traffic to be consumed by video by 2020. There's a, that's a Cisco estimate that 90% of internet traffic will be video by then. Uh, what you do see also is that television viewing is declining in many markets as internet delivery grows. So if you look at the numbers in the States, in fact television viewing has been declining since 2009. If you're a, um, a young, the younger you are, the more likely you are to watch substantially less TV. So in the UK, viewing by the, un, by the under 25s has fallen by over 25% in the last five years, according to Barb numbers. So you see this trend of people watching less TV and watching much more online video. And we think that that is going to, the change is going to accelerate, not decelerate. So here's some of the numbers that are our own uh, proof points for that data. So every minute that we're here, there's 400 hours of video gets added to YouTube. So sometimes people ask whether it's possible to watch all of the videos that there are on the platform, and in fact the answer to that is no. But what we do see is we have more than a billion users every month. We have more than 40% more people coming to YouTube every day this year than we did last. It's not bad for a 10-year-old business uh, to be growing the daily customer base at that rate. And those people are watching more than 50% more video this year than last. So we do over hundreds of millions of hours of video every day. We account for a double digit percentage of the total of the internet on our own. And that usage is growing very, very fast. And why is usage growing very, very fast? It's growing in many cases because digital video is increasingly a mobile and a personal experience. There will be something like 5 billion square feet of screens sold in the next 12 months, according to analyst estimates. And most of those screens will be mobile phones. Of course, some of them will be screens as big as this one, but most of them will be mobile phones. So the, the number of devices going into people's hands, capable of delivering an entertainment experience, grows and grows. People's batteries are much better. Phones work in 4K. Networks give you um, very, very high-speed access. And your phone becomes the way that you consume your entertainment content. I've seen surveys done where, we've, where teenagers have been asked whether they'd rather go without their phone or go without food for a day. And overwhelmingly, people choose to go without food rather than go without their phone. Here again, some of the proof points that support what I was just saying. So mobile viewing is now more than half of total viewing on YouTube. Um, in fact, we reach more people on a mobile phone in America than any television network reaches on television in America, which is a pretty startling um, statistic. And you might think that people don't watch on their mobile phones for very long, or it's only for snacking on content. And that's not true either, because more than the average viewing time on a mobile phone is more than 40 minutes. It's pretty amazing. So one of the reasons that digital video does as well as digital video does is that it's very rich and diverse. There's a huge array of quality content that you can consume. Um, a lot of it comes from broadcasters, from traditional media sources. But for many, many television companies have realized that digital is part of what they should just do. So in this region, more than 100 broadcasters put long-form catch-up content onto YouTube during Ramadan. That's something that we see repeated all around the world. So you've got long-form content sitting on YouTube, put there by broadcasters or by the original production company. Obviously, lots and lots of short-form content and content that's made for digital. Content that might be made for digital, 
uh, and then which inspires television programming later. So US chat shows like Jimmy Kimmel are particularly good at exceeding content online, having it go viral, and then it turns out to be part of a plan that is content for TV a few weeks or months later. And that's why we say to broadcast and production companies, it's not a matter of choosing between television or digital, it's an and game. Really, you just have to be where the audience is, and you want to be on every screen that the audience uses, and the audience chooses to use, and therefore digital should be an important part of the mix. But as we get to scale, what we're seeing is the emergence of a whole new class of celebrities and stars who have grown up in the digital world. Now, there are some people who've made the transition from television to digital, but there are many, many people who've become very famous merely, I say merely, for, uh, for, for their YouTube content, for the channels that they create. And in fact, when we see sur consumer surveys such as the one from Variety here, for the last two years, Variety magazine, which is a US entertainment industry uh, publication, has done a survey looking at the popularity of digital celebrities versus the mainstream. And what you see is that the majority, and a growing majority, of the top stars named by, um, by, by in the survey are actually YouTube stars rather than Hollywood stars. So these people, uh, have become incredibly famous. There's a gentleman there taking a photo, and if you don't know who they are, then it's always good to take the photo and ask your children, because I'm willing to bet that your children can name absolutely everyone that's on that page. But down here, KSI, is the chap at the bottom in the middle, is the most famous celebrity amongst under 25s in America at the moment, according to a recent survey that came out just a couple of weeks ago. So uh, as this is a sports conference, uh, Jamie asked me to say a couple of things about ways that you could win in sport. Um, so I thought I'd take FIFA as an example. So FIFA have obviously do a lot on YouTube. They've had a fair amount of YouTube coverage in the last 12 months, and they run one of the most popular football channels that's on the platform, and football is actually the biggest sport on YouTube uh, overall. So what do FIFA do? Um, well, they put highlights up of all of their competitions, sometimes during the tournament, sometimes after the tournament, depending on the way that the television deals work. They exploit their archive very actively, and they also allow fans to upload content to YouTube, which features, say, great World Cup goals, that they use our software to claim that content, and FIFA gets the credit for the uh, traffic and gets any money that comes from advertising uh, as a consequence. And then FIFA does a lot of live content. So uh, that all of their press conferences and presidential elections, which they've had quite a few in the last 12 months, have been live on YouTube. Uh, so we've had uh, elections, appointments, uh, celebratory press conferences, uh, resignations, uh, and we're about to have the next election too. So, so it's always good to be in the news uh, in that way. And I think FIFA have actually done a really good job of being on the front foot and dealing with the, that media story as it's played out. They've also shown the Ballon d'Or live on YouTube for many years, uh, and there's in fact a fan's vote for the player of the year, which garners millions uh, of votes based upon a, on a campaign. So FIFA do an amazing job, and if you think about these three things, if you can do all three of these things, that's, that's great. What I would say, if you're a sports rights holder, if you don't have the on-demand content, then it's really hard to make the live content work. Once you have the on-demand content and a, a vision of how you're going to talk to an audience across an entire year, then it's very easy to add live into that, and, and it will really then fly. And the, other th to, the other thing that I would recommend people think about is, partly I talked about this before, users like to upload content. Users like to share content with their friends. Uh, it's a good thing to encourage users to be allowed to upload content. All the Hollywood studios uh, allow fans to upload clips from movies, which they can then share with their friends. Disney changed the release schedule for the Frozen, for the Frozen DVD once they saw what the social media interaction was with, with people uploading songs from Frozen. Uh, to YouTube as, the, uh, as, that, as that those parodies uh, went out all around the world. It's quite amazing that they changed the direction of the DVDs just for that. So users paying tribute to the content is an amazing way of growing your audience. If you're in the music business, you'll make more than half of your money from content that fans upload rather than from the official videos of the songs. 
So it's a really a great way of growing the pie. And then secondly, one of the things that we're just starting to do now is we're increasingly embedding sports highlights in Google search results. So people go to Google, they search for the score of a game, and we give them a YouTube clip which is embedded into the search result there and then. So it's very, very easy to use, whether on a phone or your desktop. And anyone that's watching the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks' time, that's the way that you'll be able to keep up with the Super Bowl as it unfolds. And then finally, uh, and then um, I'll, I'll bring up, we'll bring up the rest of the panel. I just want to talk a little bit about the future, and one thing about the future that's really exciting. So digital video is immersive. It's immersive and interactive in a way that TV cannot be. Now that people are increasingly uploading 4K content and 360 videos, I think that's an amazingly exciting uh, uh, opportunity. There's a, if you go to YouTube uh, today and search for a film called Special Delivery, that's a co-production between Google and Aardman Animations, um, who do the Shaun the Sheep movie and various uh, Wallace and Gromit, and that is a 360 animated video that you can enjoy. Uh, you can, depending on how you choose to watch it, you can follow different characters, you can even experience a different storyline. Uh, and you can immerse yourself in this cartoon world that Aardman have created, which I think is a, really, really exciting. It's now possible, if you watch videos on your Android phone, to see any of those videos in 360 format. Uh, and soon that will also work on iOS devices too. So there's still a lot of work to be done to work out how to make 360 succeed. How do you tell a story in this new environment? How do you get the cameras to work? How do you get the cameras to really work so you could do live in 360? Uh, but we think that there's the storytelling desire out there to create this new form of content. And we think that the online video and YouTube in particular are really well placed uh, to service the audience's needs uh, for it. So we're really excited to see what people experiment with and what they trial. Okay, that I think is the intro to our panel. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, thank you to everyone for that. <laughs>